Invasive Brews' motto is to drink local and to plant native. But what do I mean by that? Plant native. Well, I mean, you should be planting native species to your area instead of non-native or potentially invasive species. Most of the plants that you buy from your local hardware store or Walmart are non-native species. It actually takes a little bit of research on your end in order to know what you should be planting in your yard. That's where I want to help you out. When most people think of nature, they think of the charismatic megafauna. The elephants, the whales, the giraffes, the lions, the bears. You know, the big guys. But in reality, if you lose the little guys, everything else fails. In every ecosystem, there is a pyramid of energy flow. The photosynthetic plants that absorb the solar energy from the sun use it to convert inorganic water and carbon dioxide into usable glucose, form the base of this pyramid. These are the called the producers. The next level of the ecological pyramid is called the primary consumers, the herbivores. Yes, the elephants, the deer, the bison, and all the other large herbivores. But zoom in, and you'll see so many other primary consumers. Then we have the secondary consumers who eat other secondary consumers as well as the primary consumers and even the producers. Then at the very top we have the tertiary consumers or the apex predators that consume all four levels of the pyramid. But if we look at it from an energy perspective, only around 10% is being passed up to the next level of that pyramid. So say we have 100%, we start with 100% at the producer level, the plants are producing all the energy of the ecosystem. Only 10% of that is going to the primary consumer, and only 10% of that 10% is going to the secondary consumer. So 1% of the original 100% is making it to the secondary consumer level, and only 0.1% around 0.1% is making it to the tertiary level. That's why when you see documentaries about nature, you see vast amounts of herbivores on the savanna and not that many apex predators. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, I'm telling you this because the producers are the most important block of that pyramid. They form the base of the pyramid. The more producers you have, the more primary consumers you can sustain, and so on and so on. In every ecosystem, the producers and all of the consumers have been co-evolving for millennia, and they have become dependent on each other. And the primary consumers and secondary consumers have evolved to eat on those primary or those producers. Some have even become specialists, like the monarch butterfly you, you hear about all the time. They lay their eggs on milkweed species, and that is the only species that those caterpillars can consume making that plant even more important to that ecosystem. And monarchs aren't the only ones that depend on that one species of milkweed. When non-native species are introduced into the ecosystem, the consumers will not utilize it as they would a native species. Take for example the service berry. It hosts around 124 butterfly and moth species, whereas the one of the most common landscape trees out there, the Bradford pear, only hosts hardly any, thus becoming an ecologically dead end. As a butterfly looking for a place to lay your eggs to rear the next generation, or as a parent bird like a black cape chickadee who needs thousands of insects to rear a single brood of chicks, which would you rather have in your neighborhood? So what happens when non-native plants become invasive? Many of the plant invasive species we have in the United States were brought from faraway lands for ornamental purposes. Bradford pear trees, purple loose strife, Japanese honeysuckle, even kochia were all introduced as ornamental plants and are now very prevalent invasive species. One of the main reasons that non-native plants become invasive is because of the lack of natural control. Over in their native range, there has been a herbivore or a predator or you know, a parasite or a disease keeping their populations in check. Here, that natural control is absent. So they have the run of the mill and they are not controlled. So planting native into your yard prevents new and already established invasive species from spreading. Many people enjoy feeding and watching birds through the winter. 
I'm one of them. But the most important bird feeder that you can have is your yard. Your little piece of earth can become an oasis for many species. And it all starts with the species that you plant. And the best part is, native plants have evolved in your area so they are used to the climate, making them easier to maintain. Native plants serve as host plants to many insect species in the primary and secondary consumer slots of our pyramid. And all of those insects, and even the spiders that consume them, help rear the next generation of countless bird, reptile, amphibian, and mammal species, which then in turn become a tertiary consumer's lunch, transferring that energy through the food web. But what happens in the winter? When all of the plants have died off or gone dormant, native plants still serve a purpose. Many native wildflowers produce seeds that birds will consume over fall and winter after the plants have completed their life cycles. Birds aren't the only ones to utilize the dead plants in the winter. Many pollinators such as bees and beneficial wasps use the hollowed out stems of these plants to overwinter. Others burrow underground in bare areas or even in leaf litter from those trees or the other plants. So it's just a good idea to just leave the cleanup until next spring until they're all active. Or you could just do the lazy way and let nature take care of everything. Here in the U.S., turf grass covers around 50 million acres of land. That's almost the entire state of Nebraska. Last year, in 2022, farmers only planted around 35 million acres of wheat. And in a lot of areas, turf grass wouldn't survive without the help of sprinkler systems. And in some of these areas, water is becoming more and more scarce. Even if you sectioned out a small area of your yard for native plants, you would be saving money, water, and helping your local environment. Okay, I can hear some of you saying, well, I don't have space to put in a native pollinator garden. That's okay, even if you have a patio or a deck, you can put in a couple of pots with native flowers in them. You can liven up your patio with the colors of nature, and you can become a little oasis for local pollinators. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Okay, so you've decided to put in some native flowers, but you don't know what to plant. If you go down to your local extension office or the state agency like the Wildlife and Parks or Natural uh, Resource Division, uh, a lot of them will have stuff like this. This is a Kansas native uh, pollinator mix from the Chickadee Checkoff and our extension agencies and our Wildlife and Parks offices carry these and they give them out for free. But if your agencies don't have this or they're out, that's where the research part comes in on your part. One of the best resources that i found is the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder. You can search up your own zip code and it'll bring you to native plants of that area. And once you do that, you can click on a plant and it'll bring up a list of native species that it attracts or uses it as a host plant. And if you want more information on that and what else there, that species is attracted to, you just click on the species and it'll give you more plants that you could put. Or say you just want to look up certain species of butterflies and you want to attract them to your yard. So you just go to the butterflies tab, it'll bring up some species that are in your area since you already looked up your zip code, and say I want to see the, the queen. It uses the milkweed for its host plant, just like the monarch butterfly we mentioned before. And this has a huge list of different species in your area. And since you already used your zip code, it's going to be specific to your area. Something else you can do is just type in your state's name and wild, the word wildflower behind it, and it'll bring up usually a different spe or a different website. And it, you can look up this one. I've used this one a lot in my classes and in my own personal research. You can look up by color. Say I've seen a, a purple wildflower outside and I want to know what it is. And I think I found it on this website. 
and it'll even give you the distribution of this species. But say it doesn't really give you a specific distribution and you're not sure, you could just simply copy and paste its scientific name. I use the scientific name because that'll be more specific to that species and just look up native range. And if you look up uh, on the images, it usually brings up a map, but it'll also take a little bit of research on your end. These are just a few tips and tricks that I've learned when I'm looking for native species to put into my yard or to my properties. There you have it. My argument for why you should be planting native species in your yard. I guess this could have been a really short video by me just saying it's better for the environment. But I hope you learned something along the way, and if you did, I would really appreciate a thumbs up or a subscribe if you haven't already to learn more about invasive species and their effects on ecosystems around the country. Until next time, drink local and plant native. <laughs>